Well, today I want to talk, title of my message is Be Careful How You Hear. Be, ca- be careful how you hear. And um, I want to start this morning uh, in Mark chapter 4, verse 38. Uh, some messages that we deliver are a point or two in a poem. And you walk away saying, I really, I understand that concept. But today what I want to do is I want to broadcast seed. And hopefully you walk away with something because there's a lot, of, we want to hit a lot of truth today. It's more of a teaching uh, than a preaching. But we want to look at the word uh, with new eyes. Sometimes we have to look with fresh eyes. So Mark chapter 4, uh, and I'm not going to go to this passage specifically, but Mark chapter 4, verse 3 to 8, Jesus is giving a parable. He says uh, this parable is very important. It's the first parable that's recorded. And he's talking about the sower who goes out to sow seed. And he sows the seed, he's casting seed. Some seed lands on the wayside, which represents the walkway. Some seed falls on stony ground. Other seeds fall on thorns. And then, of course, some seeds fall on good ground. And so he gives this parable. Of course, many people like Jesus, they like his teaching, but they don't really understand uh, what is being said. And so we're going to take up this message here in Mark chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, to 13, and we're going to see what uh, happens here. In verse 10, uh, G- but when uh, he was alone, being Jesus, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. And it's very important to note here, it wasn't just the disciples. It wasn't a secret club. It was those who were around him, uh, including the disciples, after the message was given. Those who were interested in discipleship, those who were interested in going deeper with Christ. They weren't just there for the message. They weren't just there to get their healing. They, were, they said, we want to follow Jesus. Can you see that? And it says here, um, and he said to them, um, to you it has been given the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables. And we understand that we have to enter by the narrow gate. Jesus is that way. And I'm amazed at how many people who read the Bible without having a conversion experience, they don't understand it. But the moment they give their heart to Christ and they have this new birth experience, they read the same thing and go, I never saw this before. How many can relate to that? And when we're in, we're in. Say, when we're in, we're in. And here, here's what the Bible's saying here. Okay? Uh, he, he says here, and he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Now, now the actual word mystery uh, is the, word, the Greek word mysterion. Okay? And I'm probably not pronouncing it right. But it's a secret known only to the initiated. Say, the initiated. When you get born again, you get initiated into the kingdom of God. And so these are, these are things that are only given to the initiated, something hidden that's requiring special revelation. You need special revelation. And so it also means something that people could not know by their own understanding. It demands a revelation from God. A secret plans, thoughts, and dispensations of God remain hidden from an unregenerated man. So when we're born again, the kingdom of God opens up to us so we can get into the scripture and read it for ourselves and allow it to transform us. And I want to clarify what the mystery is. You guys want to know what the mystery is? I think you already know, but we're going to hit it anyway. In, in uh, Second Coloss- or Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, it says, The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from different generations, the generations past, but now, say but now, has been revealed to his saints. Next verse. Okay. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ, say Christ in me, the hope of glory. And so Jesus himself is the mystery that this book unravels. And so so it's so easy as the church, and what the enemy wants us to do is to get caught up arguing about doctrine and arguing about, uh, you know, when's the Sabbath and how we should dress and, you know, how, you know, uh, you know, how you should take communion and when you should be baptized. And we get caught up on all of these things that are not important and we don't focus on Christ. Amen. 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 Now, let's look at another passage here in, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 to 3. 
It says, I want them to be encouraged. Paul is speaking, and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them, being the church, to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan. God, God wants us to understand his plan, which is what? Christ himself. Christ is the mystery. And it says here, in him, in Jesus, lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's hidden in Christ. And I want to say this is so important. Uh, you won't just stumble across treasure. You're not going to be just walking down the road. And, oh, there's a piece of gold. Oh, there's a diamond. Oh, isn't that nice? You have to have gold fever. You know, some of those guys, and they go out and they dig, and they, you know, they, they live out in the woods, and they search, and they, they dig, and they press into the ground, and they're looking, and they're hungry, and they want to find it, right? They, they, you have to search the Scripture. See, the Word of God is not hidden from us, and some, some denominations and some Christian groups will say, well, if, if you don't believe the way we believe, or you know, we have special knowledge. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what's available to you for the hungry heart. And, and I find this interesting in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 3 to 4. It says, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding. The next verse. If you seek for her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure, then you will find and understand the fear of the Lord, reverence for God. I'm telling you, that there's a searching there's a digging, there's a hunting, there has to be a hunger to search the truth, to see what's in there for you. Isn't that good? Yeah. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 4 says, it's the job of kings to search out. Do we have that one there? We don't have it, it's okay. But the Bible says very clearly that we have to search, like a king would search out. God's, God will hide it, but we're, we have to search it out. How many know you're a king's kid? Amen. You belong to the king of all kings. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. And God wants us to be hungry. God, God doesn't want you to be just satisfied following some teaching or doctrine you heard from some preacher who was just regurgitating something he learned. He wants you to get into the word for yourself and to study and show yourself approved and, and see if it's not truth. Can I hear an amen? amen. That's what God wants you to do. A, pro, the, the, a preacher's job is to get up to like a cheerleader and encourage and motivate you. You need no man teach you for you know all things for the anointing dwells within you and will teach you all things. So we're here to encourage you and motivate you and say get in the word, study, see what God has for you. Amen? And too, too many times people follow a man. They follow a teaching. They follow a system of doctrine. And the next thing you know when that person falls or when that doctrine doesn't produce fruit, they lose faith. Because their eyes are to be on Jesus and him alone. So I want to look at just the explanation of where Jesus is going with this. Mark chapter 4 verse 16. He says here, actually in verse 13, and he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? This is like the parable that everything pivots on. You guys got to get this. Look what he says. He says, the, sow, the sower goes out and he sows the word. He sows the scripture. You know, the actual, the word broadcast, do a study on that. When we listen to a certain broadcast, it means to cast words out. That's where we get that word broadcast. When the radio technology came around, they used that term to cast out. And, and he says, the sower sows the word, and the, the, there's those who are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they hear, Satan comes immediately and he takes the word which was sown in their hearts. There's something to recognize about the wayside. The wayside is actually a hard surface. Say a hard surface. Okay? It actually, that term actually means to become obsolete or outmoded. It, to fail to continue, to drop out. And for some people, the word of God, they'll come to church, but they think, well, this is outdated. This doesn't apply to me. It's the 21st century. Is it the 21st century? I get confused. It doesn't apply. It's outdated. 
It can also represent that maybe they have a hard heart. Maybe people have walked on you all your life and you have a problem trusting. And so there's a hardness of heart. And God wants you to soften your heart so the word can penetrate and can begin to bring forth fruit. But the Bible, Jesus is saying, they hear the word and because it cannot penetrate and get deep into their heart, the enemy comes immediately and snatches it before it gets to bear fruit. And then the next one here, Then likewise are the ones sown by the stony ground who when they hear the word immediately, they receive it with gladness. But they have no root in themselves and so they endure only for a time. Say only for a time. And it says afterwards when tribulation or persecution arise for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Um, this, this This is a really important one. I'm going to tell you why. Um, I'm totally off my note, so we'll just put those away for a second. Um, the Bible says, can we go back to the that verse there? I just want to read it here because it's an important one. Okay? You got it? The, one so, no, the next verse after that, do you have it? You don't have it. Okay. Uh, I'll just read it here from my Bible. This is verse um, 16. Okay, these are... Um, Likewise, the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, but they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. And here's the thing. They have no self-confidence. It doesn't say they don't have, they don't have roots in God. It says they don't have any root or any confidence in themselves. They've gone to a place where they say, I can't deal with rejection. Maybe there's genuine reason for, for that. I, I can't handle with, I dealt with rejection from my parents. I dealt with rejection growing up. These people hurt me. And I can't handle any more rejection. And I receive the word of God. It's, it's awesome. But when I go to school, they make fun of me. And you know what? I don't have a root in myself, so I can't handle this. And they back away from the gospel. How many see that? And I want to say this, we have to teach people that the Bible is very clear. When you come to Christ, Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Because a student isn't above his teacher, right? And they persecuted Jesus. You know, I was listening to a pastor a few weeks ago. He he said, "I, I used to be a youth pastor, and one of the things I did was as kids were getting saved, give their heart to Christ, he said, I would really encourage him. Hey, God loves you. You, you know, you're, you're a king's kid. You know, he, you know, he loves you. He, he, he wants to be there for you. You're awesome. And he goes, but here's a sign. And it says, Jesus loves me or Jesus loves you. And he'd get them T-shirts. This says, Jesus loves you. And he'd get them to stand downtown on the street corner with these signs. And, the, and people would drive by and some people would go, yeah. And they would honk the horns and they'd be like, yeah, you know. But then half the people driving by would begin to, put up the other finger, which I'm not going to do, and make fun of them. And people say, why do you do that to your youth? He goes, I want them to know from the very beginning that they have to partake in the sufferings of Christ. Jesus was not loved by all people. You need to understand as Christians, half the people will accept you, the other half won't. It has to be instilled. And in the midst of the journey, God wants to begin to give you self-confidence. God wants you to see what's in you. See, when we get saved, and this is where the church messes up, because when we get saved, there's two things that God wants to do. He wants to reveal himself to us. But then he wants to reveal us to us. He said to Jeremiah, I said, Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you in the womb, and I I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. I have a plan for you. Even though people are going to come and they're going to mock you and persecute you, you're going to have a word and you're going to stand as a leader. So that he could have confidence that, hey, God believes in me. He did it with Moses. He did it with Joshua. He did it, every person you read through the Bible to Gideon. He said to Gideon, said, oh, I can't do it. I'm the least of my clan. I can't go and speak. I can't go and fight. And what did God say? You're a mighty man of valor. Go in this strength of mine. No, he says, go in this strength of yours. I've given you strength. And what I've seen is I've seen Christians who come and they think it's all about, I got to get to know the glory of God. I got to get to know God. And they love God and they pray. And some of them fast for weeks and they're going after God. But, but they, they have no root in themselves and they won't allow God to reveal to them their greatness 
and they have very little fruit because they have no confidence. And we think that confidence is pride. Pride is refusing to repent, refusing to allow the Lord to deal with you. But we need to walk confidently in who God created us to be. Amen? Hallelujah. There's another one here. Now, these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So this is the third type of soil, which is the cares of the world. And you know what? I believe in prosperity. I believe God wants us to prosper. But can I tell you something? If you're in this room, and you live in Canada, you're part of the top 10, 10% of the richest people on the earth live in this room right here. You're part of that group. Look at the stats. So we're already prospering. We're already doing okay that way. When we're talking about prosperity, we're talking about spiritual prosperity. We're talking about having the fruit of the Spirit. We're talking about having great marriages. We're talking about having kids that serve God. We're talking about walking in faith and having victory over the enemy's temptations that come against us. That's what prosperity is. And so God wants us to live in prosperity. So we need to be careful. The Bible says, guard your heart. For out of it flows the issues of life. And so what I want to do here quickly is I want to go to uh, Mark. Uh, I've got like 10 pages of notes and I have no idea where I am. Um, go to Mark chapter 4, verse 24. Jesus says something to the people here, very interesting. He says, take heed what you hear. And actually, yeah, in, in, in the Gospel of Luke, when he's sharing this, he, he doesn't say, take heed what you hear. He says, take heed how you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. And as I was, I was studying this, this passage, I was reading some different commentaries. I read this commentary by Chuck Smith as I was going, I was on the Blue Letter Bible. How many have used the Blue Letter Bible? Uh, you can, it's actually a great resource. And uh, there, was, there was a story that I think is really important. I'm going to ask my wife to come up and read it. Um, and it's a very important example of how we need to be careful how we hear. Actually, I have my, need my glasses, sorry. I'm over 40, you know. <laughs> okay, so... Hey... Okay, I have a friend who had a very, or is this it? Yeah. Start here. Okay, I have a friend who have a, had a very remarkable conversion. He lived out in the area of Victorville. He owned about five different businesses out there. He was an extremely success, successful person. He owned a tractor agency. He owned an excavating company, and just had many business interests. He was an Episcopalian very nominal Christian, one of the Christmas Easter variety. And one night, he had a dream in which he was holding a sick little baby in his hands. And he was praying for that baby, and it was healed. And he woke up, and it was a very vivid dream. He went back to sleep, and this dream repeated itself three times. So in the morning, he called up his priest to share with him this dream about praying for a baby, and it was healed. The priest said, I don't know anything about that. Maybe you should call Paul Smith, who is my brother, and he can probably tell you about it. So this fellow called my brother, and my brother talked to him about the Bible, about healing in the Bible and things of this nature. While he was delivering a tractor part, uh, a tractor part to one of his customers in the evening on his way home, the part had come in, and the guy was needing it real bad, and he thought, well, I'll drop it, I'll drop it by his house on my way home. And when he got there, the fellow wasn't there. So he was explaining to the wife just how to tell her husband the procedures by which the part was to be put on the tractor. And as he was getting ready to go, this little child began to cry in the other room. And the mother went to get it. And he was shocked when she brought the child in. It was crying. It was the same child he had seen in his dream. And the mother explained how that, little, how that the little baby had swallowed some gasoline and had burned the stomach lining and how that the child would wait until the hunger pains were so great that they were greater than the pain of eating. When the child would eat, the stomach, because of the rawness, would just begin to convulse, and the child would be in tremendous pain. 
and there was really nothing they could do about it but just wait for the slow healing processes. And evidently the child was having the hunger pains again and was, re and was crying. And so the mother said, I guess I'll have to feed it. And she was just really upset. And he said, well, ma'am, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand this at all. But he said, I had a dream and I couldn't understand the dream. But in the dream, I was holding a child in my hands, and as I look at your child, it's the child I saw in my dreams. And as I was holding it in my hands, I prayed for it, and it was healed. Would it be all right with you if I hold your child and pray for her? And she said, yes, of course. And so he took the child in his arms and prayed for her. And the child said, Mommy, I'm hungry. So the mother said, Would you mind waiting while I feed the child? Because in just a few moments... It'll really start screaming as the food begins to hit the stomach. So he waited, and the child ate. No response at all, completely healed. Well, this guy didn't know what to make of it at this point. Something totally new to him. But needless to say, he really started to dig in the word of God, in the gospel and the book of Acts. He decided that the Lord was maybe calling him into the ministry. And so he sold his businesses and went to the Claremont School of Theology, which is about as liberal as any institution you can attend. There's more atheism and unbelief, I think, um, there than probably most secular universities. And he was sitting in the classes, listening to the professors, seeking to discount the miracles, seeking to discount the word of God, seeking to discount Jesus Christ, his virgin birth, resurrection, and all of these things. He was only deciding really to get to the degree to get the degree so he could go out and start ministering in the Episcopal, Episcopal priesthood. And so he thought, I don't believe this junk that they're telling me. And he thought he, has his, he had his defenses up. And he thought as this stuff was coming out that he was rejecting it and thoroughly rejecting it. And I know that it isn't true. All I want is a degree from this place and get out of here and really start serving the Lord. But day by day, this junk was pouring in and he was hearing it. Be careful what you hear. He found that as he was talking with his Christian friends and someone would bring up a scripture, he would say, Oh, but you can't believe that. You see, in the original, that isn't there. And he realized that this junk that was coming in was somehow taking root and was affecting his whole attitude and opinion of the Bible. He ended up one evening in an orange grove, grove out in Upland, sitting in his car with a forty-five pointed to his skull, um, ready to pull the trigger. He was so confused by the teaching that he was receiving there at the Claremont School of Theology, he was ready to take his life. It just brought him into a complete confusion. And there the Lord began to speak to him again. And he, of course, quit Claremont School of Theology and opened up a little church in Big Bear and just started to minister. That's right. And so he, here's the thing. He thought he wasn't being affected, but he was being affected by this, this teaching that was bringing unbelief. How are you hearing the word of God? Is it birthing faith in you or is it birthing fear in you? Is it building you up? Is it edifying you? Is it transforming you? Or is it bringing you into a place of despair? And we have to be careful how we hear. So be careful how you hear. And so many people can read one scripture and see it completely differently. And we have to come back to the word of God and let scripture interpret scripture. Okay? And so we want to uh, assimilate truth correctly. And, and I'm the type of person when some people will pray for someone and they don't get healed and they say, well, maybe, it, I guess, I don't understand. God's ways are not my ways. And, you know, maybe, you know, I, we don't understand and we just leave that with the Lord. I'm the type of person, if I pray for someone and they get healed, then I begin to press in. What am I doing wrong? Is there a nugget of truth I'm missing? Where did I miss the mark? How can I? And you begin to search and you start to find answers because you're hungry to operate like the early church. Amen? Amen. And so that's what God is calling us to as a church. He wants us to walk in a place of supernatural power. Amen? Amen. Now, uh, here's, here's the key. Doctrine is so important. Say doctrine is important. And, and the reason why is because what you hear, it's going to produce fruit in you. We just heard that story. Later on in this passage, Jesus talks about the parable of the growing seed. I'm actually going to read it in Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 29. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground night and day while he's asleep or awake. The seed sprouts and it grows, but he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces crop all by itself. Say, my heart will produce crop all by itself. 
whatever you put in will, will come out. And so as a pastor, you know, even in, in, in studying, I've studied different religions and I've read different viewpoints on scripture and, and I've stu- and it, it affected the way I thought. It began to bring unbelief into my heart. So I got to come back to the scripture. Say, come back to the scripture and see what God says. So doctrine is important because it has to produce faith in you and not fear. It has to transform you, not deform you. Amen? Amen? So how do we know? Here's the question. How do we know our doctrine is correct? I'll tell you, easy answer. Look for the fruit. Is it producing fruit in your life? In John chapter 7, verse 38 to 40, it says, He who believes in me, this is Jesus speaking. And a lot of people just think that you have to, if you believe in Jesus, rivers of water will flow. No, no, it says, if you believe in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart or out of her heart will flow rivers of dead water. Living water. And I know so many Christians, and I've been there, and, and, and how many know we're, we're pilgrims on progress? I don't have it all worked out, but so many Christians that, you know, what, what's coming out of them is depression, anxiety, fear, self-pity. How many, but the scripture says, if we believe in, in the scripture, if we believe in Jesus, as the scriptures have said, out of our hearts will flow rivers of living water. So we've got to come back to the words of God. We need the rivers to flow out of us. We, what is the river? The river of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness coming out of our lives. It's a place of freedom. That We talk about the power of God and we talk about healing bodies and seeing people healed of cancer and raised from the dead. How about the power of God to change a heart? So that the character of God flows through your life in such a way that God can trust you with the power of God. And that's what God wants to do. He who believes in Jesus as the scriptures have said, living waters, and I'm going to say the fruit of the Spirit, will begin to flow out of their life. The power of God to transform heart, our hearts, it's always tied to doctrine. Doctrine is important. Doctrine either produces faith or produces fear. And I've talked about miracles that have happened in our church, miracles that have happened in my life, which should be commonplace. Because Paul talked to the Galatian church and said, Hey, did you, did you receive the Spirit? Did you receive by the hearing, doing the law or by, by the hearing of faith that the Spirit of God began to do miracles among you? We should have miracles in our lives. And I've sat with pastors and leaders that I respect. And I won't speak down about, but I, I talk about a miracle. And they're like, are you kidding? Are you out to lunch? How does that work? And they just change the subject. Well, listen, there should be supernatural happenings in our midst. Because we, li- we, we serve a living God. And he has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, I think this will be my last scripture. Um, it says here, All the believers devoted themselves, say devoted, themselves. And if we could just focus on that for a second. We need to devote ourselves in the busyness of life. I know we're busy. I know we got stuff going on. But if we could devote ourselves to the, and here it is, the apostles' teaching and fellowship and sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and prayer. Go to the next verse. A deep sense of awe came over them. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property, possessions, and shared the money with those in need. They became selfless. They worshipped together at the temple each day, and they went to connect groups. They met in homes as well (laughs) for the Lord's Supper. And they shared their meals with great joy and with great generosity. It all starts because they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. So when I see that God isn't moving in my family, God's not moving the way I want to see it in my marriage, God's not moving the way I want in the church, the first thing I do is say, I got to, I've got to realign my doctrine. Because if I'm following the doctrine of the apostles, we're going to see the power of God. For What did Paul say? He said, I didn't come just preaching persuasive words and the wisdom of men. I came in demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power. Yeah. Amen? And so I think my prayer today um, is really that our hearts would be healed, that we would be really taking care of our hearts. 
and be honest with ourselves and, and say, Lord, you know, I've been walked on. I have a hard heart. I get a bit of pride in my life, and I want to repent for that and ask you to forgive me. And I ask that you would tenderize my heart. For some of you, maybe it's uh, there, there's stony hearts. There's, you have no root in yourself. You don't have confidence. Well, listen, it's a journey. God wants to begin to reveal to you the greatness that is in you. We have to look at the scripture and read it in the proper context. I hear all this teaching that God would not share his glory with anyone. And Jesus said, God has given me his glory and I give it unto you. New Testament saints, we partake with the glory of God. We're in relationship with God. We have to realign our thinking to walk in the faith that God's called us to walk in. To see the miracles that he wants to perform. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Why don't we stand together? I'm going to just lead you in a prayer. Thank you, Jesus. How many received something from this today? Again, scattered seed. Okay, Father, I pray for every person in this place, Lord. I pray that you speak to our hearts, Lord, by your Spirit and in a loving way, the way the Father would speak to a son or daughter. And you're saying, you're speaking to our hearts concerning whether our hearts are wayside, whether our hearts are stony, whether our hearts are con- consumed with the cares of this world. And, and Lord, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, give us hearts good hearts that, um, that would pursue you with humility. Lord, we ask that you would come and transform our hearts and we repent for any areas uh, where we've allowed something else to take your place. And all God's people said, amen. 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 I wanna, want to, um, to encourage you this week, in your prayer time, is always to search your heart and say, Lord, my heart, I want to make sure it's right so that the seed can take root and we can bear fruit. The fruit of the Spirit flowing out of our lives. And so when you start noticing that the old habit of snapping at people starts coming back, right? Or, you know, you're struggling with lust again a little bit, or you're struggling with this, then you say, oh, it's my heart, it's my heart. And you say, Lord, I repent, I ask that you cleanse my heart so the seed, which will grow all by itself, can be planted freshly and produce fruit. In Jesus' name, amen.